If you think it's time to take a hammer to your bathroom scale and rip up that diet rule book, welcome to Body Kindness. Hi everyone, it's Rebecca Scritchfield, author of Body Kindness and host of this podcast. I'm a health at every size dietitian, a certified exercise physiologist, a former chronic dieter, and a mom to two girls. Join me as I talk to guests about what it means to be good to ourselves and create a better life where well-being matters, not weight. Through these conversations, we'll reveal the challenging and surprising ways our culture keeps us searching for our worth and our appearance. Let's create a new view of health that's inclusive and built on compassion. Let's shake things up a bit and let's change the game. It's time to break up with that scale and all the other scales and judgments we use in life to make ourselves feel like a piece of crap. And you can do it with me for free in my Smash the Scale Challenge. Learn more at bodykindnessbook.com slash BK Scale Smash. Again, that's bodykindnessbook.com slash BK Scale Smash. I'll see you there. A couple other notes. If you're someone who has concerns about diabetes, whether it's a diagnosis of diabetes or you've been told by a medical professional about prediabetes or it runs in your family, I'm actually doing live support groups. We've got a four-week series going on in June. And to learn more about that, you can visit bodykindnessbook.com slash Hayes Care for Diabetes. I know that's a long one, so if you just want to shoot me an email, that's easy too. It's Rebecca at bodykindnessbook.com. Last but not least, I am offering clinical supervision. This is for helping professionals, primarily registered dietitians and therapists. If you've read and love body kindness and you're implementing it in your practice or you want some more support and how to work with clients in doing so, you can join in on my June supervision group. Again, the best way to get involved in that is shooting me an email. It's Rebecca at bodykindnessbook.com and I'll send you the link for more information. When I look in the mirror, I I look at all the things that are wrong with the way I look. I feel like a lot of my body is like my least favorite. To walk around and feel like how you look is disgusting or like shameful, it's hard. The stylist is like, why can't you fit into the clothes? What are we gonna do with this fat model? And it's completely humiliating. The fashion industry and the media absolutely reinforces the idealization of thinness and the concept of a perfect body. It permeates so much of our daily lives, it's actually hard to escape. This imagery is at the root of one of the greatest public health crises in the United States and around the world generally. I could have had a cover, but I was cut out because of this color. It is lonely being a black plus size model. There really should be more. People are so offended by the notion that plus size and fat women deserve a place in the world. Health is not defined by a number on a scale. We need a more diverse range of role models. do is create the imagery we should be seeing more of. Oh my god, it's so pretty. The brain processes images 60,000 times faster than words. So if you want to change somebody's perception, creating an image about it is the most immediate way to do it. Beauty comes in all sorts of shapes and sizes. This is important that we reflect our bodies in imagery. As models, we're responsible for the way that everyone sees themselves. We can affect change. We have to move towards a more diverse picture. We have to move because it affects our future generations of women. It's really important that every girl has that same opportunity to look at herself and say, I am enough. That was the trailer for a new documentary out now, Straight Curve, Redefining Body Image. And you can pick that up on iTunes, Amazon, and Vimeo. Uh, Go to straightcurvefilm.com to find a link to the film and download the free house party screening kit so you can have those sometimes tricky conversations about body image and the safety of your own home with your kids, sisters, 
friends, coworkers, anyone who's willing to have a conversation about why we need more diversity and inclusivity in the fashion industry. I got an advanced screener of this film. I loved it. I love seeing Tim Gunn in it because I love what he's doing um, to speak out, use his power to speak out more in the fashion industry. And I talked to the filmmaker in this conversation on the Body Kindness podcast. Her name's Jenny McQuail. She gets it. We go over the stats with body image and eating disorders and how this impacts young girls, how it impacts all of our well-being. And so I think you're going to pick up some really important, helpful tips in listening to our conversation, but make sure you keep it going. Get that house party toolkit. That is in partnership with CoverGirl and the Gina Davis Institute. And then mark your calendars for May 22nd for an event that's going to be based in New York City. There's going to be a panel of body image experts and advocates broadcasting live so we can all watch on Facebook Live if we're not in New York, and we can just keep this conversation going and create some real momentum around asking for change in the fashion industry, including things you can do in voting with your pocketbook. Hey, Jenny, welcome to Body Kindness. Thanks for having me. So you are the director of a new documentary called Straight Curve, and I'd love for you to tell the listeners about it. Yeah, um, well, Straight Curve, and it has a tagline, Redefining Body Image, is a documentary feature film on our body image crisis in the United States right now and how we're really kind of showing one very narrow standard of beauty for our next generation and how damaging that can be. And we really wanted to showcase the the pioneering people who are challenging these societies' beauty norms um, and really kind of trying to push back. So yeah, it's it's quite a, a positive look at a really disheartening issue that we're suffering right now. Can you tell me more about who is in the film? Sure. Um, well, the film premiered on Epics last year, actually. So now we're getting ready to release on iTunes and Amazon and Vimeo on demand so that people you know, all across the country and all across the world can actually finally watch the film in their own homes to rent or to buy. And it's, you know, we have a really, really exciting kind of cast of characters, including Tim Gunn, who everybody loves. Um, we have Iskra Lawrence, who's this incredible role model who has built out this really inspiring Instagram platform. She has over 4 million followers. We have some other models like Denise Bedeau and Robin Lawley and Philomena Clow. And then we also talk to some designers that are really kind of pushing the envelope, like Christian Siriano and Becca McCarran from Chromat. On top of that, we also go into into a high school in New York City and we speak to a lot of high school girls about their insecurities and their struggles and basically, you know, what we as adults kind of have done to fail those girls and, and how the imagery that they're consuming on a daily basis is really damaging them. So I think those girls really root us and ground us in the film and show us, you know, we have a problem and, and you can kind of pretend all you want that we don't and you can dig your head in the sand. But when it comes to, to body image, when it comes to self-esteem, we have a massive, massive problem in this country. And, and these teenage girls in the film really tell us that firsthand. Yeah, it was hands down my favorite part of the film, just looking at the students and hearing what they had to say you could tell it was from the heart and 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 frankly it reminded me of me growing up you know like i don't think i would have it any easier growing up now than when i did the problem with body image is getting worse i think amplified by social media and amplified by the fact of where we don't have representation of the sizes and shapes and colors and all the beautiful diversity of bodies. We don't have that represented in in many industries, but including fashion, um, which I know is like the the center of the documentary. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you're hundred percent right. I think listening to those girls, those girls are still me today. That was what was so shocking. You know, I think that they were able to articulate themselves in a way about their bodies and how they feel about their bodies in a way that I could not do when I was 15 years old. I I know that for a fact. And in a way that I'm now struggling to do even in my mid-30s. So 
it's really compelling to hear that these girls feel this way, but it's also really fascinating that they've spent the time processing their body image in a way that I don't think we ever did. So it is becoming more pervasive and it shows in the fact that these girls are kind of forced to sit and think about their body image and how it's affecting them. And, you know, I think it's up to us as the adults to try and just make it better because, you know, we can't have teenagers thinking that they can't go to school or they can't go on that first date or they can't, you know, reach for their dreams because of how they look or because they feel how they look just isn't acceptable. I mean, it's just nonsense. We just, we have to stop. Yeah, I know. I mean, I have two girls myself. And so I'm like, I'm constantly wondering if it's not that I, I don't expect them to go through difficulty. That would be ridiculous. Um, difficulty can make you stronger, but I just feel that in a lot of ways, body image issues, it, you know, it can be like gaslighting, right? So it is viewed as normal to fat talk, to body bash, to, to compare and despair your body to somebody else's. And it becomes a way that you can just beat up on yourself, on your worthiness. And, and honestly, it's like a dysregulation of your emotion because, I mean, especially in the teen years and you're going through, you know, body changes, hormonal changes. Um, it, there's, there's some sort of normal stage, right. Where kids are hyper aware of their bodies, right. Like they think Mm -hmm. if they have a wedgie that they can't get caught picking a wedgie, you know, somebody might make fun of them. Um, but, but that is a phase that kids are supposed to be able to grow out of. And I think that for me, it's like, as a parent, where I feel we we are failing today's kids is that we have normalized the idea that bodies are projects, that you should be putting all your resources into trying to achieve that thin ideal, and the automatic opinion that you know, I mean, even that there are the words overweight or obese, which are medical terms, but even having those words. It is a comparison saying this weight is unhealthy and it's too high and therefore you must be sick, you must be ill, you must put all your resources into trying to lose weight. And what is really gross about it is that the negative implications of being oppressed like that, but then also that what you would recommend to do, which I would think would be healthy self-care behaviors... But healthy self-care behaviors don't necessarily lead to weight loss or body changes. They can lead to improved health. And so it's just, that's kind of what I'm talking about in the gaslighting. It's like, we call this normal, right? Like a thing that girls are supposed to deal with, a thing that teens are supposed to deal with, and and we're not doing anything about it. Yeah. I mean, I think one of, you know, one of the biggest issues we look at in the film is health. And you, you touched on it there. And I think the reason that I was forced to dive into health in a film about body image is because when I kept questioning, you know, what is standing in the way of more diverse and inclusive imagery or what is standing in the way of more representation for all women, the issue that kept coming up time and time again was health. And this idea that if you look a certain way, you're unhealthy or this concept of, you know, you can judge a person's health by the way that they look. And it's absolutely preposterous. And I tried you know, to bring a lot of experts to the table in the film to really dismantle this idea because it's toxic and it's wrong. And it's, you know, it's causing us to have a public health crisis of its own, which is ironic, right? So, you know, the idea that we're measuring kids BMI in school when BMI in and of itself is a metric that has existed for way, way too long and has been proven time and time again to not work. You know, it doesn't measure muscle density. It doesn't measure, you know, so many things. So you could be a a top athlete and be measuring into an overweight or obese category in the BMI, which makes no sense, right? So this, this kind of idea of measuring our kids and then being sent home with a report card and we talked to, to the CEO, Claire Misko of the National Eating Disorders Association, and she honestly told me that some parents have told her 
that that BMI report card is the start of their child's eating disorder. So how is it okay to basically try and nip one issue in the bud, but in turn, by doing so, you've just caused this other huge problem. And I think, you know, we also haven't fully accepted in this country that eating disorders are a huge problem and that they're not just about vanity or about, you know, how you look, but that they're a mental disorder. You know, I think we have to accept that also and that the the ramifications of, of fat shaming someone or of telling someone they're overweight or categorizing them as obese, using a BMI metric alone can lead to an eating disorder, which in and of itself may be even worse. So I think that the health issues are, are really pertinent when it, when it comes to having a conversation about body image and, and making sure that we find the ways to do it in the right way. And I think being in the midst of, of what some call an obesity epidemic in this country has led us to basically almost ignore the other end of the spectrum, which is the massive eating disorder issue we're having by, by branding people obese. Yeah, it is. It is such a twisted intersection because the idea about caring about your health and well-being, right? Like human beings, by and large, we're born, we figure out the world, we might complain day to day, but it's like, we like to be alive, you know? Like, in fact, part of the the sickness in our like sort of wellness culture is that we're trying to prevent dying, which is actually part of life too. But, you know, but, and so it's like, it's a high value, right? Like health is a very high value for a lot of people. And then, so to have it intersected with weight and appearance is so, so harmful. It's definitely not supported by science. Everything you said about the BMI is 100% true. Even the basis of when it was calculated was based off of, you know, white males decades ago, you know. And it's just so really bothers me to think that any school would actually weigh kids, use the BMI. I mean, even doctors' offices, it's just not helpful. And, you know, anyone who might think that oh well i've got to have i've got to have a conversation with somebody about their weight i mean i mean especially kids that would blow my mind but you know kids or adults it's like i i have to have a conversation about your weight you're saying your weight is a problem your body is a problem you are a problem and it's like healthcare providers should know how to actually reframe a weight concern to well-being, to self-care, to let's talk about daily choices. And this is the worst thing you could be. This is the worst thing that could happen. And so you need to avoid it at all costs. And I think that is one of the reasons why you see that link with eating disorders. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I think you're hundred percent correct. I mean, this, this film and this conversation is not just for teenage girls. It's for women of every age. And I think that's, you know, what's really, really crucial. And it's also for women of every size. So we have models in the film that are size zero and models in the film that are size 26. And I think it's really important to kind of also recognize that women who are who maybe a size zero naturally also get body shamed. <laughs> so yeah. it's, you know, it's really kind of having a conversation about representation across the board and, and making sure that we encourage imagery to be created of what women really look like. And I think that's the key, you know, if we were to see more imagery coming out of magazines, newspapers, ads that we're seeing constantly, if those images reflected women of all different sizes, of all different backgrounds and colors and ages, then people would just inherently feel better about themselves because they'd see themselves represented and they'd feel worthy. You know, it seems like a, a quite a simple notion, but in fact, it is a simple notion mm -hmm. and it is almost a simple fix, you know? And I think the issue, the biggest issue standing in the way is this idea, is the shame and it's the stigma. And, you know, while making this film, we were confronted with this a lot, that brands and designers and, and people who are like dressing the models for all of these ad campaigns or just everything that you're constantly seeing, these people did not want their clothing or their shoes on larger women. They said no. Oh my God. And they were afraid that having their, their items on a larger woman would dilute their brand. 
So this concept is what is keeping us stuck in a rut and it is maddening on a daily basis. And I think, you know, in the film, we also try and profile companies like Airy and Lane Bryant, whose bottom line is increasing by being representative, by refusing to Photoshop images anymore, by selling to women in an empowering way, not by trying to tear them down. And, you know, I think what's really important for me is that I wanted to show industry leaders that there is a way to do this that doesn't affect your bottom line in a bad way. There's a way to do this to make money. There is money to be made. Women of every size want to wear clothes and buy clothes. And there's a massive multi-million dollar gap in the market. So, you know, it's also a business conversation. And I think slowly and slowly that is starting to register. And we are starting to see more, see more clothes available for women of larger sizes. But it's still still not enough. There, there still has to be integration, I, I feel, across the board. And, and I think kind of going back a little bit, one of the the toughest things for parents is to know how to have these conversations with their kids. So, you know, I think it's, it's systemic and it's also generational. So we're brought up believing that if your kid is carrying a little bit of excess weight, that maybe they're going to be really unhealthy and that's bad for them. You know, we're brought up thinking that. So how do we then as parents kind of navigate this and change the conversations? And I think that's, what we were trying to do with the film, but also we built out a discussion guide, a a screening kit to go along with the film to help parents, to help people, just to help women have these conversations in their own home. And, you know, we worked with the National Eating Disorder Association. We worked with Bustle. We worked with the Media Literacy Organization. We worked with a lot of different groups so that we could kind of really curate questions to to pose to people around issues of health of social media responsibility of media literacy of how we you know read the images and absorb the images that we're seeing and i think that was really important to us to to build out that screening kit so it can be used as a resource and as a tool for for parents so where can how can people see the film and get the discussion guide yeah, so the, the film will be released on iTunes, Amazon, Vimeo On Demand on May 18th. And that special screening kit will be available on our website to download for free on May 18th as well. We're also partnering with CoverGirl and the Gina Davis Institute, which is super exciting, to do a big launch event on May 22nd. So in we're hoping to do, we're doing a screening in New York City and we're going to have a panel And we're going to broadcast that panel live on Facebook Live so people all around the country can tune in and send in their questions. So, you know, I feel like a lot of the times people in in certain parts of the country don't have access to talk to some of the industry leaders or to talk to some of their role models. So we really want to give give people across the the country an opportunity to, to send in questions and really have an engaging conversation between industry leaders and the the general public and you know the the idea of what we're doing to coincide with our itunes launch is is called our house party project and that's where the screening kit comes into play and it's this we want to encourage people to have you know these sometimes awkward but very important conversations in the comfort and safety of your own home and we want moms to to have their kids and their kids' friends over. We want women to just come together for a movie night or sorority sisters to gather in their house and use the free screening kit, which we, we've made, and, and have a discussion and have some fun activities that are in the, the kit as well to really kind of help have a conversation about body image and, and what it means to us individually and personally. Yeah. I mean, it's so important. And... I know fellow parents, it's like just that overwhelming sense of anxiety about, oh my gosh, I got to talk about this or that, you know, just worrying, Mm -hmm. am I going to say the right thing or the wrong thing? Or, oh, I didn't start the conversations early enough. It's too late now. And, And it's just, no, it's not too late. And there's nothing wrong with having an uncomfortable conversation, um, or feeling uncomfortable in, in trying to open up a dialogue. I think that, conversations are really about our relationships and it's it's saying I'm here and 
I care very deeply about your well being and can I help you with this? And how are you feeling about um, things? And and certainly for me, it's not necessarily true what we might believe in our head that an individual is making certain choices and those certain choices are having an impact on their bodies. And that in fact, what puts all those negative beliefs in our mind has a lot to do with power and oppression and money. And to your point, like, oh no, we don't want our higher weight um, models wearing our stuff. Like that to me is a big mistake, like a big screw up, like that has to be fixed. What are some other things that you discovered in doing the film that it's just like, oh my gosh, these are big systemic barriers that we have to tackle? Um, I think that's a big question. I, I feel honestly that the the shame and the stigma attached to the larger body and the, the concept of fat in general in this country is something that is standing in the way of everything. I mean, it's, it's kind of crazy. And I think, you know, we have a, a global brand marketer in the film kind of talk about, we don't understand the cumulative effects of the images that we're putting out in the world. So, you know, there's just, there's ad agencies, there's, you know, brand marketers just creating ad after ad after ad and without thinking of the cumulative effect of this. So, you know, I think that's something that is quite important to kind of pinpoint all of a sudden, you know, and he talks about his own personal journey saying that until he became a father of a young girl, he just didn't realize and didn't take a moment to stop and and pause. And, you know, we learn in the film that our brain processes processes images 60,000 times faster than words. And that was a shocking statistic to me. I just couldn't believe it. And it makes sense. And if you think about how we spend our days now, you know, We are bombarded with images from the minute we wake up in the morning. If we're on our cell phones, we're scrolling through images on Instagram. There's Facebook ads popping up on our feed. You know, you walk to to school or take the bus and there's ads everywhere on the street, in the bus, on the train. You know, whether or not you realize that you're being surrounded by imagery and advertising, you are, you know, and whether you think you're internalizing it or not, you are. And I think the hope, and, and what I think could really change this is if we shift the percentage of that imagery that we're seeing to something more representative and more inclusive, more diverse, you know, you may not necessarily realize it, but you're going to be internalizing that. And I think the more positive imagery that we're seeing, the more positive we'll feel about ourselves. And I think it's kind of an accountability issue at this point. And industry leaders across the board really need to kind of stand up and recognize that we have a problem, recognize that they are part of the problem and recognize that there could be an easy way to start trying to solve this problem. I'm not saying there's an easy solve, but I think that really diversifying our imagery and being way more accountable for what we're putting out in the world and how we're telling people, you know, what they should look like and the beauty standards that we're setting, you know, we all have a responsibility and we can all change that and I think like that's what's what's really really important and I think that's kind of crucial to move forward and I believe it can happen yeah I mean I certainly I know I've gone through and kind of recurated my social media feeds and that was really helpful and I do think that it's again in an area where you have some control over a way where you can make a difference, but we are not the decision makers and the big print magazines and in the movies and TV shows and all that. And those places really need to be able to, to do better. And I've, I've certainly seen an improvement in representation since I was growing up, but what about actually taking a look at the stats of our population and matching the population to match with the imagery or at least get closer because, I mean, it's ridiculous when you look at our actual heights and weights and, and, and the diversity in our population as opposed to what you actually see get represented. Do you have any stats or kind of clarifications that would help listeners understand that gap? Um, I think, I mean, the, the biggest statistic to kind of keep, make note of is that 67% of U.S. women are a size 14 and over. 
So that's two thirds of our population and that two thirds are being ignored. <laughs> so when you look at how do we balance the scale, then you need to have two thirds of women in any campaign, in any ad, in any magazine article, in any TV show, in any movie that are size 14 and above. And that, as we all know, absolutely <laughs> does not happen. So no, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> um, and I think I think we're a long way away from that happening. But you know, I also think something you mean you mentioned social media really quickly. Something I tell everybody and I recommend doing is curating your feed, but also curating your child's feed. So knowing that, knowing how to harness this this tool of social media and using it for good, because as long you know, we we often hear about people and the negative stories about about body shaming that happen or about just bullying that happens online and on social media. But there's also a lot of really positive stories from teenagers, from women out there who now with social media, all of a sudden see themselves represented because there's women on social media that look like them. There's people putting content on social media that feels uplifting and empowering. And I know since I curated my feed and you know, since I added pictures of women who just look a little bit more like me in a bikini, I don't feel so terrible, you know, and it's those little acts and doing that for your, your child's feed is also incredible. And I think we have built out our, our Instagram platform. It's, it's at straight curve film and it's, we've tried to make this platform be a platform for just women in general. now. So it's gone beyond the film and it's, it speaks to mothers. It speaks to, you know, all sorts of issues that affect women and what happens to your bodies in the midst of all of that. And I think just seeing content like that can be really, really empowering. And also using your social media platform as a voice. You know, we now have a voice that we didn't have a decade ago to tell brands and media companies and advertisers what we want to see more of. And I think this is a crucial point that people don't necessarily know that you know brands have now hired people to specifically sit on their social media feeds and read all of those comments magazines and media companies have done the same so they are listening and they are reading in a way that we never had access to these power players before and telling them you know what they're getting right is really good so celebrating the people who are doing it well celebrate the people who are representing you and you feel good and then tell the people who aren't what you would like to see more of. And, you know, we, along with our house party project, have launched a hashtag campaign called the I Want to See campaign, where we just encourage people, tell industries out there, tell clothing brands, tell magazines what you want to see more of because they are listening. Yeah, I am going to encourage everyone to use that hashtag and because absolutely I think that we have to realize that our voice is our power mm -hmm. and we will hear an inner critic say don't do that, nobody cares what you think or you don't have time for that or you know any sort of deterrent that it will tell you, but it is a meaningful action to to stand for something, to have a value and to stand for it. When I bump up against this all the time, right? As as like a health professional, people will make the assumption that when I am um talking about reducing weight stigma and not dieting and instead focusing on well-being, I'll get questions from, oh, I mean, but what if they're like really fat, like really at mm -hmm. a higher weight? And it's, I get they don't understand about weight segments. Like you treat people no matter what they weigh the same. You give the same advice no matter the size body. And it's also like they think that if they give up on the idea that they should be suppressing their weight, controlling their body, manipulating their body, changing their body to fit, which would be a waste of time and money because biologically we fight that. But even if they were to, they believe that if they were to let go of that, that suddenly it means that, oh, well, you're just giving permission for that person to give up, or you're just giving permission for that person to not care about their health. Right. And it's BS. I mean, 
if we really care about well-being, we would make space for all to participate in a way that worked for them. And that actually scientifically shows is the thing that improves physical and mental health. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just not going to mess with your weight necessarily. And so, yeah, you know, and, and it goes back to the whole body image thing, because if we actually taught, you know, where we started in the very beginning, people care deeply about health and that is great. Okay. So you care deeply about health, but the second you equate health with thinness, you're Mm -hmm. giving people body image issue. Right. And I think that we forget and we keep saying health as if it's one thing and that's the physical body. The most important thing, and you just said it, is that health is holistic. It is physical. It is mental. It is emotional. And if you are pushing your body to the extreme that it's making you mentally unwell, or if you are trying all of these crash diets, or if you're starving yourself, or if you're doing whatever it is that, that is physically unhealthy, but it's, it's coming from a place of mental unhealth, and then that is toxic and dangerous as well. And I think giving up on all of those practicing radical self-love is mentally extremely healthy. And I think that is really key. And it probably will lead to extreme emotional health as well. And I think that's kind of where we're coming at in society now. There's a lot of fat activism is, is what they're calling it. And I think it's a lot of these women who are of a larger size saying, I give up. I don't care anymore about these diets. I don't care anymore about your stigma and your shame. I'm going to accept myself at my size and I'm going to love myself and I'm going to, you know, go on this journey with my body. And that is healthy because they're mentally healthy. And the biggest thing is that when other people express this, you know, concern about someone's health, it's total nonsense. Why is it any of your business? It's so crazy to me when people people ask that question, like you said about, well, but you know, they're very big. So clearly they can't be healthy. And the bottom line is, is it any of your business? No. And two, does that person not deserve the same level of love as you do because they're larger? Like, are you crazy? But that's what we've done with, with society now. And we've told people that they don't deserve the same level of love or the same level of care. And it's just madness. Like, I don't know how we got here, but I think that people are starting to, to burst out of that and say, nope. I'm going to accept myself as I am. I'm going to go on a journey to love myself as I am. And I think, you know, it is called radical self-love for a reason because I feel like this concept is radical right now because we're, you know, living in a society where we say that you should be thin and white. So I think it's the more women who kind of break free of those chains and show other women that it can be done, I think the more mentally healthy we'll be. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going through all these different vintage, um, ads and I was just looking at one today. I included in a talk that I'm getting ready to do. And it literally, it's like, it's one of the first, maybe the first bathroom scales and it's the new health o meter deluxe. So it's like right there, the word health, right? Then like in this big, of course, it's like this thin, wafy white woman standing on it in the bathroom. Um, But the next big bold letters are the helpful psychology of weighing daily. (laughs) And then, and then in the image, it has a little call out that says the subconscious deterrent to improper eating. And, it, and then it goes into the narrative that basically says, hey, the New York Academy of Medicine and the Weight Control Conference said that these are appropriate methods. If you want to spot reduced fat, um, the health o meter will show you how. And it says, just step on the scale, basically. Well, this is not the verbatim words, but it basically says step on the scale and based on seeing the number, you're going to automatically eat less. And this is the quote. The memory of what is told subconsciously dulls your appetite. Wow. And yeah, and so I'm just looking at this and it's like, that is marketing, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I loved watching uh, Mad Men. I loved it. But it's like you could really see how you could take something 
And so what I track the bathroom scale back to is that the penny scales on the street used to be like a joke, like a funny, like, oh, we're going to the movies. Let's put a penny in and see what we weigh. And it was like a little ha-ha thing that made a ton of money. And so inventors figured out how to get it small enough, and they needed a reason to make people want it and body and dieting that it really, there's so much power in marketing and sales behind it. And just, I mean, this this ad would never pass muster today because it's full of blatant lies. But if you think about humans as being animals who passed on those behaviors and those psychologies to their kids and to their kids, and then so here we are, fine, successful women, bitching about life right now. (laughs) Right. (laughs) But it's like, I don't know, you say it wouldn't pass now, but I'm not convinced of that either. We just page our lives in a lot of beautiful, glossy sheen and and still push it out into the world. So, you know, I think one of my more empowering and positive takeaways from from making the film is, you know, there's there's a headline in the film that says American Eagles Air Rebrand increased their bottom line by 32% by starting to advertise to women in an empowering way. So they decided to stop photoshopping their images. They decided to show women of a variant of sizes and colors and basically show women as they are. And because of this, they increase their sales by one third. So for me, I think the era of Mad Men is gone. I know for a fact that I do not spend my money on a brand that makes me feel bad about myself. You're not going to get my money. If you make me feel bad, no, like it's not going to happen. And I think that we as women are now way more empowered than we were a generation ago or two. And I think that is starting to shift the culture of advertising and marketing considerably as well, because I think people are suddenly realizing, oh, wait, this, we no longer can sell to women's insecurities. We have to sell to empower them. And it's going to change the entire landscape. And I think as more and more women also climb the ladder, which we know is important and get into those boardrooms, the more that they're going to be able to, you know, shout and fight for empowering content to come out of those ad agencies. And I think that's going to, you know, just do wonders. And I think we show in the film, your bottom line will increase. And I think that just needs to be hammered at home and eventually brands and marketers will start to listen. Yeah. Are you, you are right. As much as I would love to think that you could make an emotional appeal, you know, I'm sitting here with an article in front of me about one in five teenage girls participate in unhealthy dieting behaviors. And, and mm-hmm. this is a replication. Like I've, I've known that, but this is a recent replication of over a hundred thousand kids. And it's, and it is actually across you would think the emotional appeal of like, hey, this leads to laxative use and Mm -hmm. fasting and everything. At the end of the day, money is power. Money Mm -hmm. is in business. And businesses need, to your point, that the wonderful hashtag to be like, we're not going to buy your crap unless you do this, right? So we need the activism piece of it. And we need them to be listening and we need them to understand that there is a market. And I, I I don't know how or why they don't see it. I think that they just, well, actually, I do know. I I think what they can't let go of is that the idea that what sells is when we make people want something. They have to feel such a pain that they have to spend their money in order to get this thing that they believe is going to make life better. And mm-hmm. so it's like, well, then if people start accepting themselves, how am I going to make them feel this pain to buy this thing? And I think a lot of it is what's shifting away from like oppressive diety stuff and sell something else that people will buy that actually makes them feel good. Right. And I think, I mean, you're, you asked like, how do we make this happen? And I think, you know, there's the crucial point of the activism part has to be in place. So we, the consumer need to be telling them and they need to be listening, but they are listening. So this is the crucial point that I discovered is that these are, these brands and marketers, they've hired people specifically to listen to the consumer now on social media. So now it's up to us. So I think, you know, if anybody's to blame, it's the consumer. We have to stop blindly spending our money on companies that don't support our beliefs or don't 
basically represent us in the ads that they put out in the world or don't empower us or make us feel good. We have to talk to those brands and tell them why and what we want to see more of. And because we know they're listening. So now it's the activism part. Now it's the part where we have to come together and actually just start telling people what we want to see more of. Yeah. And I would just add to that for those who have thin privilege, don't leave that responsibility just up to higher weight folks. Like Mm -hmm. just because you can walk in a store and get, and you know, you might hate the clothes offered. You might not like the price. You might think it's all ugly, whatever. You can still walk into the store, find something that fits. And there are people who can't do that. They, they have limited to no options. Shopping is stressful. It's frustrating. Um, you mentioned Tim Gunn in the beginning. The second I saw him in the trailer you sent, I was like, I'm watching the documentary and she's coming on the show because I love Tim Gunn. I love Project Runway. I love what he is doing. I think, you know, I I hope he keeps doing more um, and he invites people to join him because that is a great example of how a person of power can create change. But, you know, there are still a lot of people that if you don't know what it's like every day to be oppressed about your body. You might feel the pull of dieting, but you don't know what it's like to have this oppression be pushed on you every single day. You can be an ally by taking and doing the same thing that you're saying. Watch where you spend your money. Stop spending it on businesses that don't support your values. Go into the stores where you shop and ask, can you carry higher sizes? Why Why are higher sizes more expensive? Because there's a lot mm-hmm. of other ways that people at higher weights are excluded that just makes life hard for them. Right. And I think that's, you know, something we really tried to do in the film is showcase those voices. We have a photographer in the film who's a size 22 and a model in the film who's a size 26. And these women just talk about their shopping experiences. They talk about their life experiences as larger women. And my hope is that, you know, the film isn't telling people how to feel, but by sharing people's stories and by learning from people, from other people who may not look like you or may not be from your background, you know, the point of that is that it opens up your heart. It opens up your mind. And then our discussion guide is meant to basically encourage people to think outside the box. So it's asking questions to make young people and and older people just think, right? So they they watch these people, they hear their experiences, and then our, our screening kit discussion guide makes you have a conversation about what it all means. And the hope is that it really just changes how you think about things and how you think about people, how you think about size or race. And it's not being, you know, hammered down your throat. There's no like lesson here. It's really to just kind of make us all think a little differently and to share experiences. And I think to me, that's how you particularly educate the young, like the younger generation now, you know, they don't want to be told things they want to come to realizations on their own. So, you know, I think that's really was a very important part of the film for me. It wasn't, I didn't want to be didactic. I didn't want to be shoving things down people's throats. I just wanted to give a platform so women could share their experiences. Yeah. And it's, it's very well done. I loved it. I'm so grateful that I got a chance to screen it. I'm really excited to see the discussion guide because I have not seen that yet, but let's just wrap up by summarizing what, what we want people to do next. So we talked about the different activism type work that you can do and actions you could take, but they can, how can they watch the film, get the discussion guide, participate in the tweets discussion and the hashtag use? Why don't we sum it up for them? Yeah, I mean, I think the easiest thing is go to our website, which is www.straightcurvefilm.com. And on May 18th, there will be links on that website for you to rent or buy the film on iTunes, on Amazon, Vimeo On Demand. The House Party screening kit will be on the website for you to download. And in the kit, it has information on the hashtag I want to see campaign. It has all of the great discussion questions and some really fun activities. We recommend it from about age 11 and upwards. And then also on the website will be information about 
our big launch event with Covergirl and the Gina Davis Institute and that panel that you can tune live uh, into and, and send your questions. So straightcurvefilm.com will have all of that great information and the release date is May 18th. Well, thank you so much for all that information and for coming on the show and talking with me today. It was a real pleasure. Thank you. It was really great. Yeah, and I love what you're doing, so keep it up. (laughs) Thanks. And that's our show. Let's continue this conversation in our Facebook group. Just search Body Kindness Podcast and ask to join the group. We also love ratings and reviews. Please subscribe to the Body Kindness Podcast and give us an honest rating and review. And if you can, tell a friend. If you'd like to support the podcast for the 2018 season, please donate at gofundme.com slash bodykindness.